So in 722 BC, the fall of the northern tribes of Israel, and we know that there were generations of wicked kings that had uh, preceded that time, names like Jeroboam, Ahab, Jehoram, that precluded the Assyrian invasion, and this, the Assyrians were part of northern Iraq. So that was the initial uh, you know, judgment that we know that Israel was in a time of, of just great um, brokenness as a nation. They had turned their heart away from God. They were worshiping foreign gods. They were doing everything that the nations around them were doing. And there was judgment that was pronounced. And so the, the northern 10 um, tribes of Israel came under that judgment. So 722 BC, they were attacked by the Assyrians and those northern kingdoms were, uh, those northern tribes were wiped out basically, or they were taken. So move forward to 606 BC. So almost 116 years, 15 years. As Babylon gained control over Palestine from Egypt, so Egypt had actually moved in in this time, the wave of the first Israelites were taken into Babylon, Babylonian captivity, including men like Daniel and Babylon, which would be modern-day southern Iraq. It was about 50 miles outside of what is modern-day Baghdad. And Babylon, I don't know if you knew this, was 14 miles square in size. It had a wall of 300 feet tall, 25 feet thick, and 35 feet into the ground. They, it's, the, it's the size of equivalent modern-day Chicago. 56 miles of wall that was 25 feet thick and 300 feet high and 35 feet in the ground. Okay. Big. So eventually... So this is 606 BC. Eventually, the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital of Jerusalem would fall in 586 BC to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The temple would be destroyed and all of its articles of silver and gold um, that were used in the temple were plundered and taken back to Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar was the, was the king over Babylon at this now time. So they had become the power. So you can see like Assyria came in, Egypt came in, Babylon at this moment was. And in 606, that was the beginning of the 70-year period when the nation of Israel would come under their 70-year their exile, right? So a lot of people were left then, and it wasn't until 586 that eventually the city of Jerusalem would become under siege by Babylon again in Nebuchadnezzar, and the city would be destroyed, and the, the temple would be destroyed, and all the articles of it would be taken. So that was actually 20 years into the 70-year period that that would happen. All right, so then let's fast forward, and I'm almost done with this history, but I think it's important to understand that in 539, a man named Cyrus, who was king of Persia, so a completely different kingdom, had gained power in, in that area, modern-day Iran. They would conquer Babylon in roughly 539. Okay, so you kind of see there was all this different transfer of power that happened there in about 170, 180-year period. Does that make sense? There was just all these different kingdoms that were coming and taking over. And finally, Cyrus... Is the, is the man that's in charge of the, of the kingdom that was operating in, in power in that time when this 70-year period that had been pronounced over the nation of Israel was about to expire, okay? So here's the interesting thing about this is that ironically, it was the custom of the kingdom of Persia that when they came into a foreign land, and took it over, that they would allow those that they had enslaved or taken under their care or by another conquering nation, they were allowed to return to their customs and they were allowed to go back to the place of what was comfortable to them. And in, in a lot of cases, they were sent back to their foreign land, uh, once, once their land, now foreign land, that had been plundered and they were to go back and to take inhabitants of it because what happened is they actually wanted them to go and repopulate and send their taxes back, okay? It's all about taxes, right? But the purposes of God in this moment, you can see how the unlikeliness of Israel returning to its homeland, to returning Jerusalem, to returning to Judah, to rebuild the temple 
was brought about through the custom of the nation of, of Persia at that time or the, the land of Persia. Do you see how God so intricately is involved in these things that seem so outside of our control and our understanding? All right, so here's the exciting thing, right? The, the moment of, okay, we're going, we're heading out, we have all the provision we need, we have the, uh, we have the edict of the king, we have the decree of the king that says to go, and actually Cyrus, when he spoke this word over them, they were, not, they were to go with like a blank check from him. Not just that they went with all these articles, but whatever it is that they needed, it was, it, the letter said that they were to, uh, to get everything they needed from the, the region. So those that were the, the governing authorities over um, Palestine then were to, were to supply them with everything that they needed. So they left with that understanding. So there's great excitement, right? As you can imagine, the word of the Lord is being fulfilled. It's being, uh, the, you know, the promise of returning back to uh, Israel is there. There's this massive army of people that's descending upon it. They're excited. You know, there's singers. There's, there's all the, the Levites are there, the priests. Um, it's this company of people that is prepared to go and to rebuild the temple. How many times does it happen where uh, we have everything that we need and where there's great excitement and then there's the reality of now we're boots on the ground and we got to start? <laughs> Right, it's, it's amazing to build a house, but it takes a lot of time to be able to get to that point, to put a shovel in the ground. So they return, they begin to, you know, with the thought of rebuilding, and shortly thereafter, they face their first moment of resistance. Have you noticed there's gonna be resistance, often early, to the purposes of God over your life? What happens in those moments of resistance? There's a resolve, there's a reliance, there's fortitude that is built within us, there's trust, there's grit. I've actually met few people that have not gone through the resistance on the route to the fulfillment of what it is that God has spoken over them. So moving forward to Ezra chapter four, verses one through five, I wanna just speak to the resistance that they came up against. So it says, now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Er Shahadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. It's interesting that the Bible says now the adversaries of wanted to join in with them and to help build. Verse three says, but then Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers, houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our Lord God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah and they troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of, king of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. All right, so there's a, there's a bunch that happens there as far as the timing goes, but we can see that the purposes of, of these that had gone to rebuild the temple had been, um, had been challenged. Two quick things I wanna say here. Um, we always need wisdom in who to align and who to deeply align ourselves with. We always need wisdom in who to deeply align ourselves with. In that moment, it might have felt really like, oh, we have help. We have, you know, these guys that uh, would seem to be in power, these, these ones that have access to the, the taxes, to the wealth of the region, they want to come and help us. I believe that the wisdom of the Lord, though, revealed that their involvement would have certainly diluted the efforts of what it is that that the Lord wanted to happen and what was in the hearts of those that were going to rebuild the temple and the, worship, the type of worship that they wanted to enter into. So we need, to be, we need to be cautious. Okay, this is a tricky one, right? Because it's always suspicion and cautiousness and wisdom can feel 
eerily the same at times. So when we're coming into deeper levels of relationship with people and, you know, partnering with them and all kinds of things, I think there is this level of, of time that it takes to get to know people so that you can actually see what they're all about. Um, and not just to jump into something and say, oh, this person's amazing, and so I'm going to hook my, my cart to their horse. And, you know, three months later, you're like, man, that didn't go the way I wanted it to go. Has anybody ever been in that situation before where someone comes along, you're like, oh, they're amazing. And all of a sudden, it's like, dang, you know, they're really good up front, but the backside, you know, is pretty rough. 